ready for an exciting chapter. Good morning, everyone. A glorious day. You're very brave to choose to be in here rather than outside in the sunshine. But that will come a bit later. Uh, I want to talk this morning about the divine pattern. Uh, I don't know how many of you have read Escaping the Pentagon of Lies, the book. In that book, I've tried to articulate how the divine pattern really pulls everything together. You're going to get a picture of that, Colin. I've got you with it. Well, there you go. All right, all right. Bring it in closer. It's, uh, well, before I go any further, I, I want to pray. And hopefully we can uh, understand that the foundations of this message are laid very solidly. And when we understand those, a lot of things make sense. And that will then play into the presentation that I want to do tonight. So, for those who are able, we shall kneel. Father, we give you thanks for a beautiful day. We worship you. We want to tell you that we love you. That you are merciful, gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. We thank you for your mercy towards us and our children and our grandchildren. And we pray, Father, that, it, that as we meditate on this subject, that you would teach us and you would guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. Probably as a preface to this presentation, one of the most fundamental principles that has come into my understanding uh, is 2 Corinthians 3.18, by beholding, we become what? Shorthand, monkey see, monkey do. That's, that's the shorthand version. By beholding, we become changed. And this became uh, an important principle to me, particularly in 2016. Why is it that we all die? Because what do we behold? Death. A God of death. That's why we die. That's what Adam did in the beginning. He saw a God of death when God was coming to him in the garden. He imagined that God was coming to kill him. He imagined him to be a killer. We are all children of Adam and by nature our natural inclination is to believe that God is a God of death. 144,000 cannot die because why? They don't believe in a God of death. They have the seal of God in their forehead, which is his character, which is a character of a being who does not kill or destroy. He is just like his son, who is the brightness of his glory. And so by beholding, we become changed. And this became very important in my understanding, having served as a minister of religion for quite a number of years, I had the opportunity to deal with many marriage breakdown situations and conflicts. In one situation, I had to rescue a woman and her children uh, because there was such violence between husband and wife that I had to take the wife and children to my home until something could be arranged in dealing with that violent situation. And all the time I'm asking myself, why is this happening? Uh, do you know how many domestic violence uh, events occur in Australia every day? Every minute? It's in the hundreds. In the hundreds. We have a crisis in the marital relationship. I think we're all aware of that. Since COVID, it's all gone ballistic. People are having to be spend more time with each other and that's making them even more crazy and marriage is collapsing and um, maybe part of the reason why that is is I, I, I just was found this amazing and it, it's, I'm not, I'm not going to have any indignation about this statement but when the, Prime Minister, the New Zealand Prime Minister was asked what is a woman he couldn't give an answer he didn't know it's whatever you want it to be. And when you get to that stage, how do you have a marriage? How does that even work? It's, 
the whole paradigm has been redefined and reshaped and I feel terribly sad that this man, he probably knew what he wanted to say but he knew if he said it he'd lose votes so he couldn't say it. So there's enough people who've decided that a woman is whatever you want it to be and that's why a 16 year old boy in Canada who I think as I mentioned who stood up for the young women, he got kicked out of a Catholic school for you're saying that a, a women's toilet should be kept for women. Is that, I mean, I grew up believing that. Yeah, absolutely. It is. <laughs> it's, it's, everything's changed. We have to go with the new normal, or do we? We won't go into that today. One of the key principles that I, I wanted to just step you through, and I don't have the booklet here, it is on the website, The Divine Pattern of Life, where I've li I listed, I've got one, well, one, two, three, four, five. I've got six here. There's seven, seven key principles to the divine pattern. And the first one, of course, is based on 1 Corinthians 8, 6. And most of you should be familiar with this. But to us there is but one God, of whom are all things. The word ek in the Greek is source. One Lord Jesus Christ, by whom. The word by, dia in the Greek means channel of an act. The Father is the source, the Son is the channel. And this source-channel relationship is the divine pattern of all life. When you understand this system, your whole world will change. Everything will change in terms of how you understand things. Now, when God said in the beginning, let us make man in our image, what image are we beholding? Are we beholding source-channel? Or are we beholding a committee of three co-equal, co-eternal beings? But whatever image you behold is the image into which your marriage relationship is going to operate. By beholding you become changed. And that, it is the issue of marriage upon which I myself became deeply troubled about the subject of the Trinity. Does that make sense? Because of its impact on marriage. Because men acting in co-equal relationships, where there is no headship, no submission principle, violence is much more likely to occur. Now, it is true. It is true that men in the 1940s and 50s taking a headship position that were more dominant, women were treated very badly. And part of the current reason we're in this situation today as we are is that men in the, many men in the 1940s and 50s beat their wives in drunken madness and women had to protect themselves and defend themselves against this craziness. And so now with the reverse, we're getting the opposite starting to take place as a result of that. So headship and submission, and then we need to look at some of these texts. Headship to a human being means domination. Headship in God's system means channel of blessing. It's completely different. In the spirit, headship, and Fiona can recite this for us as we talked about this many years ago, that if you want to get have a shower, you must submit to the shower rose. You've got to stand under the shower to get wet. If you want to get clean and get wet, you want the blessing of a shower, you must submit to the shower rose because it's going to bless you with water. Obviously, you're controlling the mixture, but it's going to bless you with water. And that's God's principle of headship in how that, that operates. And we see and, um, in the headship principle down here, 1 Corinthians 11.3, I would have you know that the head of man is Christ, and the head of Christ is God, and the head of the woman is the... Therefore, the same headship that exists between father and son is the same headship that should exist between husband and wife. Does that, does that make sense? And one of the great problems that we have today is because changing this headship model into three co-equal, co-eternal be uh, well, beings, husband, wife and children become a co-equal committee, don't they? If you watch The Simpsons, who, who's the head of the house? The kids. <laughs> they are the spirit, aren't they? That pervades 
and the parents are running around trying to please their children and stop them from doing really, really dumb things. That's, that's, that's a trinity, isn't it? Husband, wife, children, co-equal relationship with the children, the wife, equally decide ultimate life events and decisions are made by women and children and the father. Uh, the way he gets to make decisions is by beating them to a pulp and forcing them into submission. And that's how he gets to make his decisions. That's, that, ha that happens in many families uh, in that situation. So, uh, but the headship of heaven is that the father loves the son and gives to him all things. He pours everything in his heart upon his son. And this is the image. A husband should pour everything he has upon his wife. He should not hold anything back from her. He should tell her what is in his heart. And there should be nothing in his heart that is hidden from her. And nothing in her heart that is hidden from him. They have a transparency. They have a love for one another that darkness does not enter into. Darkness enters in when we have secrets. When we have to have secrets, when we're engaged in addictions or activities that we're ashamed to talk about, so we don't talk to our spouse about these things, that's evidence of darkness. You don't want them to know. You're engaged in, in certain things. Now, on the, a caveat on that, of course, is that sometimes Satan can tempt you as an individual to do things or to say things that you don't want to do. The things that Satan tempts you with, you don't pass all of that information on to your spouse. You go to God and say, no, I don't want that information in my head. I don't accept it. I reject it. So, but it's things that you consent to do, things that you wish to do, that you would hide from your spouse. That's darkness. That's not transparency. The marriage relationship is about transparency, not uh, What's the word? Not bearing false witness. That's a key component. Integrity of relationships require transparency. When there's a lack of transparency, relationships are always going to come to an end. Is that true? The, the lack of transparency guarantees the end of the relationship, ultimately. And I'm sure you've been in relationships where you're dealing with people where, uh, because they want to they know two groups of people, they want to be in friends with both groups, and so they, they act this way with this group, and they act this way with this group, and when the two groups come together, they get crunched. Because they, they can't be both things at the same time. And a, a person in that situation ends up having to dump one or both of their friends because they can't deal with the contradiction anymore, because they've, they've lived a life of disintegrity of lack of transparency and men and women who bend themselves to be what the people are around them are definitely showing a lack of worth and value within themselves because they need the approval of other people and therefore they do what other people think and then when they're with their friend and then they see them in another situation and they completely change who they are it's quite a shock i think many of us have experienced that kind of relational situation. Telling the truth is critical to lasting relationships. And of course, Matthew 3.17, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Absolutely vital for the source to bless the channel, to tell them that they are precious, to tell them that they are important. And, um, you know, you often hear men say, well, you know that I love you. Do I have to tell you every day? Yes. <laughs> That's what a blessed does. It says, I love you. And it backs it up with actions. You know, not, not, the, not the Jekyll and Hyde. I love you. <clears throat> Stick him under the fifth rib. Yeah. You don't, don't do that. The big thing that I, I want to focus in on today is the glory and the brightness component of the divine pattern. And we see that in, in Hebrews, Hebrews 1. I want to focus in on this component. We'll go back a little bit. Verse 1, God who at sundry times, in divers manner, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, 
hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Did God appoint his Son to be heir of all things? Do I, do I even have to ask this question? You know, it's, it's like a what is a woman question. It's really basic. Did God appoint his son to be heir of all things? Yes, which means that God then had an authority over his son in order to have the ability to confer upon him this ability to be heir of all things. That's obvious, isn't it? By whom also he, being the father, made the world. So who made the world? Father through his son. And this is the principle of life. This is how life operates. <laughs> Just take it out of it. So, <laughs> um, sorry? Oh, you get too much of that up on the screen. Oh, I won't, I won't go on. All right, I'll submit. <laughs> <laughs> so God made all things through his son so the thought about this whole world and the way that it was created in the beginning was the thought of God God transmitted this thought these thoughts to his son and his son magnified the thoughts of God and made them into existence and this is how every one of us have come into existence well, well, maybe not. But the, biologically we have. <laughs> the the man has a seed which is invisible to the human eye. The seed goes to the woman. The woman magnifies the seed and she makes it a person. She makes it a reality. This is the principle upon which how God works. We were made in the image of God. Each one of us, we come through the source of our father and the channel of of our mother and the woman is the one that makes it she magnifies it she grows the seed from very very tiny and she's the one that grows it into a child well a child <laughs> and eventually becomes a child yes. a man a woman Still can be a child. so yes glory and brightness and we continue and it says who being the brightness of his glory the word is there is supplied but the reason it's added is because it says the express image of his person whose person god's person so jesus is the brightness of whose glory father's, father's glory so the father has glory and jesus is the brightness of the father's glory now in an independent way of thinking if you look at jesus and he's brighter than the father does that mean that jesus is more valuable than the father no no because he's not the glory of his own brightness he's the glory of the father he's the brightness of the father's glory this is a really really important principle to understand so in the divine pattern the the channel is the magnifier of the source. And this is a very, very important principle to understand. I, I, I just wanted to use that as an introduction of understanding that in the divine pattern, the channel is a magnifier of the source. So, we have, uh, yeah, the magnification principle. One, one negative example of this, I, I was counselling a couple, and when I first started counselling the couple, the woman was showing signs of being a complete nutcase. Emotionally unstable, all over the place, crazy. Talked to the man, completely composed, logical, reasonable in his expression. But as I continued to talk to them and discuss with them, um, he was the nutcase and she was manifesting his nuttiness. You get this magnification principle. Now, it's not always the case 
But usually, emotional instability is manifested more in a woman than in a man, typically, not always. And therefore, when a woman is making lots of noise, it can often be because the seed that's been planted and the environment that's been created for her is such that she manifests, he's able to hold it in and stay much calmer, typically around other people. At home, boom. But around other people, holds it all together. And she's the one that's melting down, and therefore she's the problem, right? This is what often happens in a, in, in a, in a magnification situation. In a positive sense, wife is feeling loved and blessed and cherished. She's much more vocal. And this is where we come again to the male-female relationship. And you typically get a laugh out of this, but men typically speak 10 to 12,000 words a day. Women typically speak 16 to 20,000 words a day. There's a magnification principle. I think I'm an exception to that rule. Yeah. I talk a lot. <laughs> so, uh, but typically, because men typically tend to summarise information and say things in shorter, more summarised sentences, women will describe things with much more emotion and feeling, and therefore they need more words to say what they need to say. And that's a very important process. Now, if men and women are co-equal, one of the pet peeves that men unfairly have is they say, can you get to the point? Get to the point. And your point is? <laughs> Am I speaking nonsense? <laughs> Whereas, you know, round and round the garden, like a teddy bear, getting to the point by this part and this part and this colour and this and that. And the woman will often pick up much more detail than the man will pick up. He's looking for the skeleton. The, the key main elements, because he's got to summarise all of the information, whereas a woman will pick up the, the scent, the colour, the, all these other beautiful things to make it beautiful. And one of the principles of blessing is that a husband, in blessing his wife, will listen to her when she's describing something, and the natural male tendency is like, yeah, and your point is, because he just wants the end point, whereas she's giving him the, the cooks to her. The whole experience. <laughs> the, the whole experience. The whole enchilada. <laughs> <laughs> to give it richness and depth and feeling. <laughs> <laughs> And this is, there's, there is some, there's some, you know, balance here in terms of, because it does say that, that women sometimes, it says 16 to 20,000 words with gusts of up to 25,000 words. <laughs> I'm very gusty. When you get up to 25,000 words, it's very windy, ladies, you know, like, that's not good sailing weather. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, magnification. If men and women have to be the same, it creates friction, doesn't it? Because we're not the same. We see the world differently, but we, in a divine pattern relationship, there is a harmony which brings magnification. Magnification. And so... Taking that point about magnification, understanding the father and the son relationship and understanding the differences that they can harmonise when a husband blesses his wife and cares for her and protects her and she has a safe environment where she feels safe and protected, the gusts aren't going to be as big. If she doesn't feel safe and protected, you're going to get more gusts. Much more. Just... You know, what is a woman? <laughs> Very basic stuff. Happy wife, happy life. Even the ha sorry. Happy. I thought you said happy mouse. <laughs> <laughs> 
So taking all of that principle into other aspects of magnification, this is what interested me about the feast. If there is a relationship, if there is a divine pattern relationship between the Sabbath and the feasts, then that means there is a magnification principle that occurs, which means the blessing that you get in the Sabbath is magnified in the festivals. That's what attracted me to the feasts. It was the divine pattern, principle of magnification that attracted me to the feasts. Now, if your Sabbath is a legalistic experience, then the magnification is going to be wormwood, isn't it? It's going to be bitterness. It's going to be terrible. But if your Sabbath experience is sweet, and there is a divine pattern relationship between the Sabbath and the feasts, then your feast experience is going to be marvellous. It's going to be wonderful. That's what the divine pattern would tell you. And we discover this to be the true, to be true in terms of the bread offerings. We talked about this last night. The bread offerings that exist in the Sabbaths, which are then magnified in the feasts. So that as Jesus is the brightness of the Father's glory, so the festivals are the brightness of the Sabbath glory. And as the Son is the express image of the Father, the feasts are the express image of the Sabbath. Once you get the pattern clear in your mind, it's, it's very simple, isn't it? Very, very simple. And that's, that's what really attracted me. And one of the things that convinced me of this is in John, is it John 19? It says, and that day was a high, high does it say high day or high Sabbath? High day? Ooh. In John? John, yeah, there it is. Yeah. Why is that? Okay. 1931. The Jews, therefore, because it was preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day. Why was it a high day? First day of unleavened bread. First day of unleavened bread. On their time. On their time. For our, for our understanding, it's second day of unleavened bread, but it's still a high, high day. High day. In the feast. In the, because it's within the feast. So when a Sabbath, when a Sabbath occurs within a feast period, you get a high tide spirit of God. Does that make sense? That's what the scripture is saying. And what's fascinating to me is that with the tides of the moon that at the time of the new moon and the time of the full moon, what happens to the tides? You get bigger tides, don't you? And at the new moon there is a festival and two times in the year the Passover and the tabernacles begin at the full moon when there is a greater tide of water symbol of the spirit upon the earth. Light. So this magnification principle really starts to kick in when you see the relationship between the Sabbath and the feast. For those of us that have been Sabbath keepers, not feast keepers, we've been given the rough end of the pineapple. Well, at least we've got the pineapple. We've just got the rough end. Because <laughs> we didn't get the whole deal. This, once, once you put the source and the channel together, you get flow, you get movement. When you just have one element sitting there spinning around, you don't have movement. But once the two come together, you get momentum, you get movement occurring. Debbie. Well, I did notice when I became an Adventist after being in the Pentecostal Church that the Adventists were interested enough in what they believed to go and Yes. That would never have occurred to me. Yeah. To use my holidays and the spiritual There wasn't anything to go to. And and a big camp of the Adventists was based on the Tabernacles principle. Yeah, so that's right. Mm. Yeah. And it's interesting that 
at least in South Queensland, the big camp is around September, end of September. School holidays. It used to be in August when the school holidays in August. Okay. The townsville used to be in May with the school holidays okay. in May. So the school holidays moved, so can't move with it. There you go. You just blew my bubble. No, God is, God is blessing because North New South Wales has it around this time, so they have like around a Passover. Yeah. Okay. Good. So so he's, yeah. being, he's being kind because of the school holidays. That's right. trying to drag us. <laughs> to <where it> <laughs> be. Trying, to, yeah, trying to get momentum. Trying to get no movement. And it's just interesting that the, 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 the camp meeting is an eight day gathering. Yeah. 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 There, there's connections there. There's connections there, that's right. But a lot of people don't know what those connections are. So the, the Sabbath and the feast. So if there is, we understand that the Sabbath is protection, it's a protector. What is the feast on the magnification principle? Isn't it a greater sense of protection? You know, if we were taught that the making up the breach in the hedge was to keep the seventh day Sabbath, but God says, if you keep my statutes and my judgments, are the feast statutes and judgments? Yes. Stat statutes? Yeah, forever. So, the magnification principle of the feasts is that we're going to experience a greater level of protection. Moses proved this to Pharaoh in word and deed in Exodus 5, verse 3. And notice... And, and for those of you who understand the typology, that the plagues in Egypt is a typology of which plagues? The last, plague. the last plagues. What was it that triggered the plagues to begin? What was the question that Moses asked? Can we go to the feast? This is what initiated the plagues. Okay, that, that's important to keep in mind. Pharaoh refused. And what did Moses say to Pharaoh? He said, then, then they, said, uh, they said, the God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray, the three journey, days journey into the desert. Why did they need to go three days journey into the desert? Because if they sacrificed the animals in Egypt, what would have happened? They would have been stoned. So they had to go three days away in order to not to offend the Egyptians. Uh, sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Lest he fall upon us with what? <coughs> Not keeping the feast will lead to pestilence, pestilence and sword. I just want to check the Young's literal. What does it say? We sacrifice to Jehovah our God lest he meet us with pestilence and sword. In other words, that he hides his face. And he allows a breach. So, in this case, not keeping the feast led to a breach which would bring pestilence and sword. Okay? And those things are what happened. So, um, a word to all of us that are prepping for the coming crisis. Feast keeping right up there. You want to be protected from pestilence and sword? You need to keep the feasts. And, yeah. and what is the principle? What is the principle? And we want to go to this level of understanding. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days show your labour, but the seventh day is the Sabbath. A day of rest. So that means, as I talked about last night, to rest, human beings who are unholy, don't, there's no rest for the wicked. The only way you can rest is to receive a spirit of rest. So when Jesus breathes upon you his spirit of rest, what happens to your body, mind, soul? Rests. And when you rest, what frequency do you vibrate? Rest. And what goes into the earth? Rest. We are made of the earth. We affect the earth. This is why if you truly enter into the Sabbath and feast experience, the rest that, you, that comes into your soul, and, and just try and capture this, wherever you place your foot, there will be peace. No earthquake can touch you. No tornado can touch you. And this is how this message is going to become noticeable to the world. It's this principle. 
It's vibration, it's frequency, it's energy. That's what Tesla said, isn't it? But it's connected to the Sabbath and the feasts. So when tornadoes and hurricanes and earthquakes come, God's people cannot be touched by these things. Unless when you see these things coming and you forget this truth and you're filled up with fear and anxiety about what's coming and your soul then is overwhelmed with negative vibration and frequency and you then suck that vibration into you, you're going to get hit with earthquake, famine and all these things. And of course, the greatest thing that's going to cause earthquake and fire and wind we learn from Elijah, the spirit of indignation within Elijah created earthquake, wind and fire. We have to extinguish the earthquake, wind and fire, the indignation by receiving a spirit of rest in order that we can be protected from the elements. Because as God said to Cain, the curse will come to you from the earth. Does that make sense? He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That is to be in the bosom of the Father. And where, when Christ rests in the bosom of the Father, most prominently is on the Sabbath and during the feasts. And that spirit of rest that is in Him, He breathes upon you. You embrace that spirit. And therefore there is rest all around you. This is how we're going to get through the plagues. Does that make sense? You need to keep the feasts. To receive this spirit. Because we need much more of this spirit. Because of the spirit of antagonism and anxiety and fear and everything that's going to come upon us. Lest, remember Exodus 5.3. If we don't keep the feast, God will meet us with pestilence and with sword. Not that he's bringing it. Simply the consequences of all the vibration and frequency that we're engaged in. This is really, really important. And the feast are a magnification. Those who keep the Sabbath will have a measure of protection. But again, it's severely muted if you don't worship the begotten Son. Because He's the Prince of Peace. If you worship God the Son, you're not worshipping the Prince of Peace. You're simply worshipping, worshipping a piece of a prince. But anyway. So. Only, got the on Only got the shower on a tiny little bit because of the seventh day. You will have some measure of protection. And we ask this with all sincerity and without malice. During the Second World War, did the Sabbath keeping of the Jews protect them? No. It didn't. Many of them died because they did not have the Prince of Peace who was in the Sabbath. It couldn't protect them. We need to remember this. It's not simply keeping a day. It's receiving the spirit of the Son of God in that day, in the bosom of his Father, that brings that peace to you. Debbie. And that's Hiroshima. All those Sabbath things went up to the mountain. And that's the day that the bomb, the bomb, and they all were Okay. They were all being persecuted, so they went up there for the Sabbath day and spent the night in the next When you say Sabbath kids, so they believed in Christ? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, and when we have many examples of this, but I'm simply saying, as this is a typology of the last days, feast keeping is going to become very important. People say, do you need to keep the feast to be saved? <laughs> That's a loaded question, isn't it? <laughs> and my answer is, do you need the Holy Spirit to be saved? Well, then you need the feast. This is good. You need more of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and the Sabbath, and this is the magnification principle that we see in the feasts. Okay? Now, I want to, want to talk to you about another aspect of magnification. Is tithing important? Why is tithing important? Is it a statue? It's a statue. So if we have tithing is, as, a, as a source, is there a channel? You ever heard of second tithe? Second tithe? Deuteronomy 14 talks about the second tithe. 
If you're tithing, you've got the rough end of the pineapple. You need to second tithe to get momentum. Did you catch that? Second tithing creates momentum and magnification. Deuteronomy 14 and 16 talk to us about the second tithe. Okay? Now, second tithe, what was second tithe for? Second tithe is for coming to the feasts, caring for the Levite and for the poor. Personal evangelism. Second tithe is your, evangelist, your personal evangelistic budget, both to feed yourself and those that you want to reach. The first tithe, and based on the divine pattern principle of invisible and visible, the first tithe is for the Levites, which means it's for the priesthood, which means it's for the ministry. It is a 10% that goes to the ministry and is not under your control. Well, it's under your control to give it. <laughs> but it's a free will offering. Second tithe does not go to the ministry. Or you can give it to the ministry if you want. But I would suggest that you should use it to get to the feasts. Which means that if you're gathering your second tithe, should you ever have any problems finding accommodation to come to the feasts? Second tithe covers all this. And if, you know, save up during the year, get yourself a nice place to stay for the feast that's comfortable for you. If you want to rough it, rough it, but use your second tithe to make yourself comfortable. That's what God wants you to do, so that you have a comfortable place to be and using your second tithe to do this. And when you second tithe from your tithing, you get momentum, you get movement. And things start to happen. People say, 20% of my income! Whose income? Who gave it to you? <laughs> Where did you get it from? Who gave you the talents, the abilities to earn money? God. Hey, is he going to shortchange you? Say, I want 20% of your income. Is he going to say, <laughs> I ripped you off? <laughs> no. You can't outgive God. You, you, you're going to be blessed. Second, and, and this is really important, just like with the feast as a protection. We're heading into an economic crisis. What do you need to do to prepare for that economic crisis? You need to tithe and second tithe. If you want to get through this crisis, you, you need to do these things. Do you need to tithe to be saved? It's the, same, it's the same issue, isn't it? You need to tithe to receive the spirit of generosity so that the spirit of generosity, as it's flowing out of you, you create a vacuum and it comes down into you. The vibration, the frequency of generosity comes back to you. God ensures this. He makes certain of this. And I've, I've told some of you the story, not all of you have heard it. It was in 2014 that I said to my wife, I want momentum. I want flow. I want to test this to see whether there's a magnification principle in second tithing. I want to start second tithing. Now, when we made the decision to second tithe, we had just moved house for a schooling for our sons. Our rent had gone up $80 a week. We then had to pay extra money for the schooling, which was another few hundred dollars involved there. So our costs had gone up four or five hundred dollars was it four hundred I can't remember around four hundred dollars a week and our income had not gone up and right then Adrian comes up with this brilliant idea to start second tithing whose idea was this and I said well here's the way to test it you said prove me now father prove me now herewith if I will not pour you out a blessing greater than what you can receive so we started second tithing. And it just all worked. And it's amazing how did it work. And it was in 2014 when I started second tithing that I was in the United States for seven months that year while my family was at home. 
I originally had arranged with someone to help cover my costs while I was overseas so I could continue to provide for my family. Once I got to the United States, that offer disappeared. I'm on the other side of the world for seven months and I don't have the promised money that I was going to get to support my family. What am I going to do? Well, I'm second tithing. God made it happen. The money just came in. Just came in. Just amazed me. Now, part of the thing to do, particularly around the Feast of Tabernacles, and we really need to look at this for a Feast of Tabernacles, and we gather up our second tithe, we gather up all the people around the community that are in a hard way, we put them up, we feed them, we bless them, we pour out our second tithe on them. That's evangelism. The excess that you have... Because you're going to get excess. When you start the second tithe, you're going to get momentum. And when you get momentum, you're going to have excess. And I remember in 2014 in Tabernacles, I had excess from all the... Not from the person who I originally tried to secure for myself some money that blew up, but from all the money that was donated to me over the time that I've been travelling all around these different countries, and I had all this excess. So at the Feast of Tabernacles... I started, I started listening to the ground, looking for, listening for people that had financial difficulty. And so I, I'd slip them some money. And you know, every time I did that, I'd slip someone $500, go back to my car, uh, caravan, and under my pillow, $500. I couldn't get rid of it! It just kept coming back to me. The more I gave it away, the more it came back to me. And I was laughing my head off. Going, this is fun, Lord. You know, we're all passing money around and giving it to each other, isn't, that's the spirit of generosity. I've got, to, I've, got to, I've got to get rid of it. I couldn't get rid of it. I just couldn't. <laughs> that's, what, that's what you get in the second tithing. You get momentum. And I would encourage you to keep your second tithe for evangelism, to purchase books, to help people, to help the poor. To get to feasts, to pay for feasts. This is what Second Tithe is, is all about. And when you do this, I noticed that my, my, my ability to survive cost of living pressures became easier. I used to watch the bank account more closely before I Second Tithe. I've been Second Tithing since 2014, and I. I, I I don't worry so much about those things. I just leave that in God's hands. I just give it to Him. And He's just blessed me so abundantly. And it's not, it's not primarily the financial, okay, I'm going to second tithe. I give some and I get more back. That's mercenary. That's a mercenary approach to things. But I give it because I love my God and I'm happy to do that. And whatever happens, I let Him worry about those things. And I've just found the best thing for me has been the psychology of not worrying about money. We all understand the psychology of worrying about money, don't we? <laughs> oh, I'm not going to have enough money. <laughs> Second tithing can cure you of this worry. If you believe it, if you believe it. And the divine pattern principle tells me that second tithing... It's going to create momentum, it's going to create flow, and my wife and I are living proof of this principle. And, um, you know, I've had some people say to me, oh, like, we'd like to give you some second tithe. No, give it to someone else. It's, it's not, I'm, I'm part of the ministry. You, no, I don't need second tithe. Use it yourself. Get the blessing directly yourself. Help somebody else. That's for you to use. For your evangelism and outreach. If we have a joint project, we want to purchase something, we all put second tithe into, okay, we can, we can do that. But don't, that only the first tithe goes to ministry, not second tithe. That's really important to understand. So I know that, you know, I was, I was talking to someone recently that was having financial difficulties, and I, it's a delicate subject. Because I say, are you tithing? Oh, well, I can't really afford it. I said, put God to the test. Put God to the test. And within a, a few months, suddenly their, their situation changed and their financial situation improved. God comes through every time. And I, I, I want to 
say this with all sincerity, we are coming to an economic collapse very soon. If you want to survive that collapse, second tithing, as well as first tithing, is mandatory for yourself to get through that process. That, that's, that's the main point I wanted to make in this presentation. It, it seems counterintuitive to give away, but it's, this is the law of heaven. This is the law of life for the universe. Christ received to give, to pour out, to give to others. And this is what, this is what I would really encourage you to do. One of, my, one of my friends from Germany, I asked him once, you know, in this message, what is the thing that has really been one of the best things for you in this message? He said the divine pattern of tithing. That sort of shocked me, but it didn't. <laughs> I didn't expect him to say that, but it was a, a real blessing. So I would encourage all of you to, I mean, do the research, look at it, consider it. And I'm, I'm hoping that at Tabernacles, we'll have saved up the second tithe and Maybe then we can invite more people and do a soup kitchen or you know, whatever. Or we, we, can, we can think down. That's, that's kind of where we need to head, I think. And this is going to become more important as we're noticing that many Australians are suffering. They're being thrown out of their homes. They're having difficulties. They're being squeezed. And, uh, well, some of the media are mentioning it, just to remind us of who's in charge <laughs> and we are in control and you're going to suffer and uh, and Queensland is suffering some of the worst housing shortage in the country why <laughs> because of what's happening in Victoria and partly because of the energy crisis people are worried about not having enough money to pay for gas and and electricity, so they come to a warmer climate where they don't have to use so much of those things. I think that's part of what's driving the drive north. The other thing, the other thing why I think there is potentially, I don't know if everyone's thinking about this, but there are, there are provisions in the Queensland Constitution that are different to any other state that offers more freedoms to people in this state. Now, if you don't know about them, you can't access them. But I was looking at this recently. There are statutes in the Queensland law that gives you more freedom than other states. And constitutional people are aware of this. Uh, and whether that's going to stay that way, I mean, they could strike that out at any time. Uh, but at least it's a, it's a bait for some people, I think. That's why they want to come to, to Queensland. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big state. <laughs> it's a big state too. You can get lost here. All right. Thank you for listening. I hope that was a blessing. Let's, uh, let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the divine pattern between you and your son, the principle of magnification. And I thank you, Father, for the divine pattern of the Sabbath and the feasts and the divine pattern of tithing. May we take this to heart that we may receive of your spirit and we may be protected from the challenges that are coming upon us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.